and somehow this makes me feel that the society where uh, a courtesan can assert this right that I am not willing to be with you, this right, this choice, that society is rather an evolved society compared to the society we are living in right now. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. If you are studying under West Bengal State University and if you are in the first semester, then you must be struggling with Mrichya I have already completed the whole text of Shakuntala and many of you have requested me to complete Mrichya with you. So this is going to be the first video of the series where we will be taking up the different acts of the play Mrichya Today in this video, we will be looking at the first act and before that, the benediction or the prologue part of the play. Stay with me till the end of this video because I am going to read through the most important portions of the act so that you will have every idea about how the characters are developing, how the plot is developing and that will lead you to understand the second act in a better way. This is Monami Mukherjee, welcome once again. The play Mritya Katika, translated as The Little Clay Cart, is often categorized as a Prakarana. So before starting the text of the play, let us try to understand what is a Prakarana and how is it different from a Nataka. That will give us some idea about what to expect from this play, what will the themes be or what will the characters be like. Normally, Natakas are more serious kinds of plays which are based on any incident or story or legends that are already present in the culture of the country. For example, Shakuntala happens to have its origins in the Mahabharata. Therefore, Shakuntala is a Nataka. It is not an invention by Kalidasa. But in case of Mritya Katika, we see that this is entirely an invention of the dramatist Shudraka. Therefore, it is a Prakarana. Normally in Natakas, we have characters uh, belonging to royalty uh, or you know even divinity. So, we have these gods and angels and kings and queens and royal characters mostly. Uh, and it's all about their lives, their problems, their struggles that we come across. In case of Prakarana, we have the common people as central characters on stage. This is also the case with Mrichakatik. Next important point uh, which I think we should remember is the language. Usually in Nataka, the language that is used by the dramatist is uh, you can say ornamental one and it has poetic elements. If you read through the lines of Shakuntala, you would see that Kalidasa is so poetic most of the times and the way in which these people speak on stage, they are not the uh, way you know common people speak with each other. So in case of Prakarana we see, uh, there is a tendency to use the language of the common people and for that uh, even Prakrit, uh, the alternative language you know, there is Sanskrit and there is Prakrit, Prakrit is used extensively as we also see in case of Mritya Katika. Although we are going to read it in translation and when we are reading in translation, we will not be able to understand which sentence is uh, spoken in Sanskrit and which is uh, spoken in Prakrit. But it is seen that uh, mostly the kind of style of conversation that we see here, uh, you see a common way of speaking. So that is important uh, aspect of a Prakarana. So these are more or less uh, you can say main features although I would also like to add that in case of Nataka usually the theme or is usually a single theme uh, 
uh, which is a very grand theme and in case of prakarana you have uh, these episodes and digressions and subplots so it's more like uh, you can say a counterpart of comedy uh, that we find in english drama whereas nataka may be seen as counterpart of tragedy although in many cases natakas do not end on a sad note okay but the style the treatment that is more like the treatment of tragedies whereas prakaranas follow the treatment of comedies uh, they deal with social issues social intrigues uh, how common people deal with their day to day problems so in mrichakatika therefore we are going to expect problems and lives of common people uh, within an imagined location but realistic so we have a lot of realism in mrichakatika which we might not always have in shakuntala so with this introduction i'm going to jump straight to the benediction part of the play benediction is like this invocation of epics the playwright he addresses some kind of god or deity which he considers to be very important and seeks the blessings then he gives a kind of overview of the play what we are to expect from the play and this is done through uh, not the main characters of course but by some actors or sometimes as we find in this case we have the director himself uh, coming on stage and speaking to the audience directly telling us about not just uh, the play but also the playwright so we will start reading now his bended knees the knotted girdle holds fashioned by doubling of a serpent's folds so he begins by talking about a god who has a serpent folded about him so we know which god he is talking about he is talking about lord shiva his sensitive organs so he checks his breath are numbed till consciousness seems sunk in death within himself so this figure of lord shiva is in a dhyana position where he is meditating and is almost looking like a dead man is not moving at all with eye of truth he sees the all soul free from all activities may his may shiva's meditation be your strong defense on the great self things he knowing full well the world's vacuity so while this world represents a kind of vacuity uh, a kind of senselessness meaninglessness shiva's meditation becomes a representation of something very eternal something very meaningful and why is shiva evoked because i have uh, told this earlier too when i was discussing rasa theory with you that shiva is the name of nataraj too nataraja is the divine figure the muse you can say of playwrights of dancers anybody who wants to perform on stage and therefore lord shiva is offered uh, this kind of benediction in the beginning of the play now the stage director he speaks enough of this tedious work which fritters away the interest of the audience so he is starting with a very uh, comic stand that uh, okay let's not bore everybody let's just jump into our action now let me then most reverently salute the honorable gentlemen and announce our intention to produce a drama called the little clay cart its author was a man who vied with elephants in lordly grace now the stage director he introduces to us the dramatist or the author the playwright uh, who wrote this play who vied with elephants in lordly grace whose eyes were those of the chakora bird that feeds on moonbeams glorious his face as the full moon his person all have heard was altogether lovely first in worth among the twice born was this poet so this person who wrote this play he uh, was a very 
uh, glorified figure, he looked uh, very glamorous and he was twice born, twice born in the sense that he was a Brahman. When the society was uh, you know, classified along these lines of the four Varnas, then uh, it was said that the Brahmans and the Kshatriyas, they had right uh, to get this Upanayana where they get this sacred thread and during that occasion, it is as if they are born again uh, into consciousness, into enlightenment. So, Shudraka is a twice born person. Known as Shudraka far over all the earth, his virtues depth unfathomed and alone. His virtue, his good qualities, they are endless. Unfathomed means, fathomed means when you have some idea about something's depth. But when it is without any depth, it is so deep that you cannot measure it, that is unfathomed. So, Shudraka's qualities have no end. Nobody can measure him. Therefore, he is unfathomed. And again he continues, the Samaveda, the Rig Veda too, the science mathematical he knew. Now, this uh, appears to be quite uh, weird because we know that this play is written by Shudraka and possibly the benediction was also written by him. So, it is he, uh, you know, is trying to talk about himself in these uh, glorified light. Uh, I do not know, maybe he himself wrote these or maybe some actual stage director added these uh, things to it. But it was important that his name was mentioned uh, so that this play does not become an anonymous play. Okay. He knew that uh, like in back in those days, uh, they did not have these uh, options to print their books, you know, publish them in an official way. Therefore, uh, within the lines of the play, some mention should be there about the author, about the poet or the dramatist so that posterity, future generation, they will always remember the name of the writer. This also happens in many of the shlokas uh, that are there in uh, Vedas and uh, such scriptures because those rishis or those sages, they thought that this is the only way to stay in the memories of future generation. So, we have Shudraka's name here, some uh, more lines on his praise. Uh, I am not just going into the details here. Uh, what we gather from here is that he was a king and he was a fairly successful king. He even tried the Ashwamedha uh, Yagga which is like this horse sacrifice, it is a very difficult thing. And at the same time, you know, usually kings do not engage in academic activities, intellectual activities. Shudraka, unlike other kings, he actively engaged in these uh, activities where he could exercise his creative side as well. And then comes the theme of this play. So, I will just skip a few lines to the part where uh, the story is given to us. And in this work of his, within the town Avanti named, dwells one called Charudatta, famed no less for youth than poverty, a merchant's son and Brahman he. So, this story is going to be the story of Charudatta. Charudatta is a poor person young man and he is a Brahman and a merchant's son. So, he belongs to a higher society so far as his birth is concerned, but he does not have the wealth to match his standards. His virtues have the power to move Vasanta Senas in most love. So, here comes the second character that we have in this play. So, there is going to be a love affair between Charudatta and Vasantasena. Vasantasena falls in love with Charudatta. Fair as the springtime's radiancy and yet a courtesan is she. So, how is Vasantasena described here? She is described as a very fair, very beautiful woman and then this uh, conjunction is used but 
and then this information is given to us that she is a courtesan. Courtesan is you can say it's a polished word which actually means a prostitute. But if you uh, think about courtesans, you do not see them as you know present day prostitutes. Courtesans had a very strong social standing in those days. Uh, in fact, a lot of prestige was there, you know, associated uh, with their, their kind of work. And sexual labor was also considered to be a valid uh, way of earning one's living. Uh, often it was seen that uh, some king or some nobleman would uh, pay special uh, respect or uh, social standing to these courtesans and they had a lot of wealth as well. So Vasanta Sena, she uh, was not just a prostitute, but she was a very celebrated uh, figure. Uh, she was like the showstopper, everybody wanted to be with her and she falls in love with Charudatta. So here King Shudraka, the tale imparts of love's pure festival in these two hearts. So this is a story of celebration. What celebration? The festival of love, of prudent acts. So there will be some plot on some prudent act. People will act in a wise way, proper way. A lawsuit's wrong and hate. There will be an issue with a legal suit. There will be some kind of legal trouble which we will show you in the play. A rascal's nature. So there will be a villain too. And the course of fate. So what we will have in this play is a hero, a heroine. And then there will be this villain and a lot of intrigues, a lot of plot changes. And eventually this will be uh, you know, something that will end as fate will decide. And then he moves about a bit. So now the audience is looking at the stage and there is the stage director on stage, nobody else there. And then he says something very important here. Now, one thing I want to tell you that maybe uh, like I'm reading from a particular uh, translation, this might not match with yours, but even if some of the sentences or some of the constructions appear different to you uh, than the book which you are having with you right now, you don't have to worry because uh, since this is a translation, you need to understand the implication of the speeches, what the speeches mean rather than dwelling on the words only. Okay, So you don't have to be that bothered uh, when you see that I am uh, giving you a sentence which doesn't match with your book. Okay, So it can happen. Hello, here I am, but no, both the particular occasion and the general custom demand that I speak Prakrit. So till now probably he was speaking in Sanskrit and now he thinks that this is a Prakarana and the occasion is a light one. So he shouldn't use that heavy language, the language of the gods. So he uses the language of men, which is Prakrit. And then he talks about his wife. He walks about, looks around him. Here I am at home. So we are to imagine that he is at home. Now in those days, stages did not have much of prop, you know. Uh, it was not like elaborate designs were painted um, with lots of props. Props means the things uh, that are used on stage to create a set, maybe a throne, okay, or of a tree cut out. Those things were not there mostly in Indian classical plays. What we have is a description through the dialogues. You know, people used to describe the scene to audience. So there is usually this blank backdrop and through the words uh, we can think that okay this is happening. All right. So he now tells us that he is at home, this stage director, he goes in and then he sees that everything in his house is turned upside down. Merciful heavens, why in the world is everything in our house turned upside down? A long stream of rice water is flowing down the street. The ground spotted black where the iron kettle had been rubbed clean is as lovely as a girl with the beauty marks of black cosmetic on her face. 
usually when he enters his house it's a mess he doesn't have food okay he's very poor perhaps today he sees that uh, the rice is cooked and the rice water is flowing which shows that the rice is already done and then he can see that everything is in order it smells so good that my hunger seems to blaze up and hurts me more than ever has some hidden treasure come to light so oh, have we come across some treasure some wealth we suddenly have so much food in our house or am i hungry enough to think the whole world is made of rice there surely isn't any breakfast in our house and i'm starved to death but everything seems topsy turvy here one girl is preparing cosmetics another is weaving garlands of flowers so he is describing to us some scenes perhaps those scenes are also enacted as he is speaking he can see that some women are you know making garlands so he is describing to us a very well the household what does it all mean well i'll call my good wife and learn the truth and then the actress comes uh, who is his wife uh, here here i am sir you are very welcome mistress command me sir what am i to do Mistress, I have been practicing so long, and I am so hungry that my limbs are weak and dried up lotus stalks. Is there anything to eat in the house or not? So he wants to eat because so much of good smell has made him hungry. There is everything, sir. Well, what? For instance, now the wife says, what are the things that are there? That's rice with sugar, melted butter, curdled milk, rice, and all together, it makes you a dish fit for heaven. May the gods always be thus gracious to you. All that in our house? Are you joking? Yes, I will have my joke. So she says this as an aside, which means that she is telling to the audience, like she is not telling this to the husband. That yes, I am going to have some fun now. It's in the marketplace, sir. So when he asks that, okay, so much is there in my house, she says. Not in your house. Those are in the market. Go and get them. And the you know, director is very angry. Okay, you wretched woman. Thus shall your own hope be cut off, and death shall find you out. For my expectations, like a scaffolding, have been raised so high. So my expectations are raised so high by this beautiful smell and imagination, and now uh, that has to fall. So he's very disappointed. Forgive me, sir. Forgive me. It was only a joke. But what do these unusual preparations mean? One girl is preparing cosmetics, another is weaving garlands, and the very ground is adorned with sacrificial flowers of five different colors. So, we being Indians, we realize that this is preparation for some kind of puja, some kind of religious festival, of course. This is a fast day, sir, and usually when um, Hindus uh, they prepare for some puja for some religious practice it's customary for them to fast not not have any food therefore this is a fast day what fast the fast for a handsome husband now if the wife is telling the husband that i'm fasting for a handsome husband that becomes very unfortunate for the husband to uh, think that then what am i doing here in this world mistress or the next in the next world sir gentlemen look at this she is sacrificing my food to get herself a husband in the next world so this is how you see uh, audience is engaged and a sense of comic is established it's like telling the audience that you're going to see something for which you don't have to be very somber and serious and you can expect good things to happen in the play so this is how you know it's just like you know morning shows the day here we have the benediction and the prologue uh, telling us not just the story but the essential element that's going to run through the play the mood of the play which is going to be pretty comic don't be angry sir i'm fasting in the hope that you may be my husband in my next birth too so there is a very sweet thing of her to say this but eventually what we see is that this director because they have this puja in their home 
scheduled that evening they want a brahmin to perform the rituals so he wants to get hold of a brahmin and then he notices charudatta the hero of this play his friend maitreya he is walking by you know close by and he decides to get hold of maitreya and request him to perform the puja at his house he invites him but maitreya he is not yet on the stage he is outside and a voice comes from outside that no i am not going to do it because i am very busy today the director is trying to bribe him that see uh, there is going to be a good feast and you're going to have a good present moitreo is not interested and this is where the prologue ends and we straight away go to the first act first act is like a continuity moitreo he was being requested so he was refusing and it begins there so if you are a live audience you wouldn't notice much of a change of scene or circumstance uh, when the prologue becomes the first act so that is a continuity we get here the subtitle of the first act is the gems are left behind so there is going to be some incident where some gems or jewelry they will be left behind moitra continues you must invite some other brahman i am busy and yet i really ought to be seeking invitations from a stranger moitreo openly says that he doesn't want to go and perform any puja but his situation is that he needs to go to these invitations because that is how he could survive now they do not have the kind of wealth uh, which they had earlier because charudatta who happened to be the source of moitreo's income charudatta had given away most of his wealth in charity uh, to his friends and now nobody comes to his house and charudatta doesn't have a steady source of income and is in uh, you can say an impoverished state and so moitreo feels that he needs to go to these pujas and celebration so that he can take care of himself oh what a wretched state of affairs when good charudatta was still wealthy i used to eat my fill of the most deliciously fragrant sweet meats prepared day and night with the greatest of care so he's talking about the past where charudatta was a wealthy man i would sit at the door of the courtyard where i was surrounded by hundreds of dishes and there like a painter with his paint boxes i would simply touch them with my fingers and thrust them inside so he is kind of creating art out of eating i would stand chewing my cud like a bull in the city market and now he is so poor that i have to run here there everywhere and come home like the pigeons only to roost and here is this jasmine scented cloak with charudatta's good friend junavridha has sent him so this is how information is given to us he is complaining about his present situation he is complaining that charudatta is not wealthy anymore and then he is telling us that he is carrying a cloak like a chadar uh, which charudatta's friend has sent as a gift to charudatta and he is supposed to give it to him now as he is speaking we see charudatta entering the stage uh, we understand that it's evening time and he has just finished offering his prayers and he comes along with radhanika radhanika is the maid of the house she serves charudatta's family charudatta enters and he is in a melancholic mood so till now we were having a very uh, jovial mood we were having a happy note and now charudatta comes and the mood changes considerably what is he telling us upon my threshold where the offering was straight away seized by swans and flocking cranes there was a time when swans and cranes used to come and receive his offerings the grass grows now and these poor seeds i fling fall where the mouth of worms their sweetness stain so now he is like as a part of his evening ritual he is throwing some 
sweet seeds earlier beautiful birds used to come but now no birds are coming and these seeds will be consumed by worms is he being literal about what he is saying no it is a metaphor he is using these birds beautiful birds they you can say are metaphors of those friends who used to come to his house earlier when he was wealthy and receive everything he had to offer and now that he is poor nobody comes to his house so we see that there is a lot of melancholy a lot of sadness in charudatta when he starts speaking to us when moitra asks his friend what are you thinking about he says my good friend a candle shining through the deepest dark is happiness that follows sorrow's strife when somebody's life is filled with sorrow and there is happiness at the end of it is like a candle is shining through the darkness but after bliss when man bears sorrow's mark his body lives a very death in life so he makes a very interesting observation here he says that if somebody has a life full of sorrow and then reaches happiness it's like a candle is lit so it's very nice but if a person is happy for a long time and then becomes sad and is filled with sorrow and suffering then that becomes a lot more painful why because now this person has the memory of his happiness too so this sorrow is something which will make him even more sorrowful that is what he feels well which you would rather be dead or the poor moitra is very witty very witty and he offers a lot of comic relief to us ah my friend far better death than sorrows sure and slow some passing suffering from death may flow he is saying that i would prefer death because death might bring some suffering but that suffering is a passing suffering it won't stay forever sorrow is like it continues bitterly for a long time but poverty brings never ending woe my dear friend be not thus cast down your wealth has been conveyed to them you love now mitra gives us some explanation as to why charudatta is so poor now because charudatta was a very charitable person and he used to you know kind of freely give away uh, whatever he had to his friends and like the moon after she has yielded her nectar to the gods your waning fortunes win an added charm so it's like he was like this full moon which eventually gets reduced till it completely vanishes so charudatta's wealth is also like that but while reducing in size the moon is still beautiful when it is say uh, only a small crescent shape in the sky the moon is still beautiful and therefore charudatta although he is not wealthy he is still very good person comrade i do not grieve for my ruined fortunes but this is my sorrow they whom i would greet as guests now pass me by so he is not so much bothered about his wealth which is gone he is bothered about the friends who are gone he is bothered about the fact that these people were never his friends at all okay so this is a poor man's house they cry as flitting bees the season over desert the elephant who store of ichor spent attracts no more so we gather that charudatta is a very emotional person and he feels that his worth his value is somehow reduced when he is left all alone and there are no friends to be with him moitra knows that his friend is emotional and you see even though charudatta has become poor moitra is still there with him so we also have some regard for this person that he is offering charudatta what the other friends could not or can found the money it is a trifle not worth thinking about is like a cattle boy in the woods afraid of wasps it doesn't stay anywhere where it is used for food so he makes these 
stupid comparisons to make Charudatta feel good about things and uh, laugh at things. And we somehow feel that their friendship is very important for Charudatta. Then there is a very short speech where Charudatta will make us believe that he is not a person who is sad over his wealth. Because if somebody is always sad about wealth, then that person is not a very heroic figure, right? So we do not have much respect for a person who goes on feeling sorry because he has lost a lot of gold. And therefore, he says, Believe me, friend, my sorrow does not spring from simple loss of gold, for fortune is a fickle, changing thing, whose favours do not hold. But he, who sometime wealth has taken wing, finds bosom friends grow cold. So it is the loss of friendship that has affected Charudatta more. So as they go on talking uh, with each other, Maitreya consoling Charudatta, we have a different kind of scene happening right after this. We hear a voice behind the scene. Stop, Vasanta Sena, stop. So there's a man's voice. And now imagine the stage to be divided into two halves. On one half, we see Charudatta. There's like this imagined partition or maybe a real partition was set up, which is like this wall of Charudatta's house. On one side, that is the outside of his house, we have Vasanta Sena, a very beautiful and well-dressed woman. She is running away from some men and they are asking her to stop. And what are they telling her? Stop Vasanta Sena, stop! Why flee and run and stumble in your turning? Now, uh, although in some of the translations it is not possible to show this, but this person Sanstanaka, he has a strange way of pronouncing sa. He cannot pronounce sa, he pronounces it as sha. And so, if he would say this, he would say it like this Stop, Vasanta Sena, stop. Why flee and run and stumble in your turning? Be kind, you shall not die. Or stop your feet. So, that is how he would say. That is creating a comic effect, but is this a comic thing? I mean, two men chasing a woman, of course not. And we see that this person, Sanstanaka, is pretty dead about catching this girl. And there's his servant and there's his courtier. So, three people actually uh, chasing Vasanta Sena. Vasanta Sena is not at all interested. Uh, we can skip a little bit. There is a very interesting part where Sanstanaka is continuing to persuade Vasanta Sena that she should stop and not run away. And what is he saying? Your jingling gems girl clink like anything. Like Draupadi you flee when Rama kissed her. When did Rama kiss Draupadi? In some imagined epic by this man. Uh, Rama is a character of Ramayana. Draupadi is a character of Mahabharata. So, we understand that Sanstanak has absolutely no knowledge about any scripture, no knowledge about any epics, any, any traditional stories, but he uses this half knowledge in any way he likes. And what he says? I'll seize you quick as once the monkey king seized Subhadra. Subhadra, so far as my knowledge goes, was abducted by Arjun in Mahabharata. Monkey King, uh, probably is talking about Shugriv or Bali, uh, both of them were monkey kings. Uh, monkey King was character of Ramayana. Again, he gets things mixed up. And then he says, Shubhadra, Vishyavashu's sweet sister. So, total confusion there. So, we gather that Samstanaka, maybe he is a royal figure, maybe he is a powerful man, but he has absolutely no knowledge about anything which he talks about. Vasanta Sena is seeking help. She is crying out, Pallavaka, Paravritika. So, she is very anxious. All her servants are disappeared. She cannot find anybody. Alas, how comes it that my very servants have fallen away from me? I shall have to defend myself by mother wit. So, I have to do something, plan something. I, I cannot just fall into this trap. So, we understand that Vasanta Sena 
who we know she is a courtesan she does not want to have anything to do with this person sansthana ka somehow they manage to corner her she says sir i am a weak woman and then she asks them sir what do you expect from this pursuit my jewels heaven forbid a garden creeper mistress vasanta sena should not be robbed of its blossoms say no more about the jewels so you so this courtier now he says that uh, you are like uh, a beautiful woman wearing some jewel like this plant who wears blossoms and since blossoms should not be taken away from plants or so jewel should not be taken away from women so he's trying to tell her that i'm not interested we are not interested in your jewelry what is then your desire i am a man a big man a regular vasudeva so vasudeva is like i am like this figure of krishna uh, krishna means a lot of things he also means a very well built lover uh, every woman desires so he says i am like this vasudeva you must love me how can somebody force but he is doing that heavens you weary me you tire me come leave me your words are an insult vasanta sena has no interest in sansthanak and this is something very interesting because vasanta sena happens to be a courtesan a prostitute and it is her profession to offer sexual service to anybody who has payment that is the uh, economics of her profession but she also has the right to refuse somebody so here we see that this idea about the rights about somebody's body right of somebody's body that belongs even to a person who sells the body as a profession and somehow this makes me feel that the society where uh, a courtesan can assert this right that i am not willing to be with you this right this choice that society is rather an evolved society compared to the society we are living in right now the courtier has his logic vasanta sena your words have no place in the dwelling of a courtesan you are a courtesan so you don't have a right to say uh, who you will entertain and who you will not which as you know is a friend to every youth now he is giving us the idea which commonly people have about prostitutes that if you are a courtesan if you are selling your body then you are available to everybody remember you are common as the flower that grows beside the road in bitter truth your body has its price your beauty is dower is his who pays the market current rate so she is like a commodity and a commodity does not have any right about the customer or the market so long as the price is paid is he who pays the market current rate then serve the man you love and him you hate and again the wisest brahman and the meanest fool bath in the self same pool so she is compared to this pool where anybody can take a dip if they have the money doesn't matter if he is a brahman or a meanest fool and then he ends by saying you are the pool the flowering plant the boat and on your beauty every man may dote but vasanta sena keeps on insisting yet true love would be won by virtue not violence earlier sansthanak had said that i want you to love me and then she says i cannot love you how can you just force me to love you and then sansthana gives an information to us but master ever since the slave wench went into the park where kama's temple stands so he is talking about vasanta sena's uh, action where she went to this park where kamdev's temple is erected kamdev is the god of love she has been in love with a poor man with charudatta so now we know that okay vasanta sena is refusing to go with sansthanaka because she is already in love with somebody 
and that somebody is our Charudatta. And Sangstanak feels that before she fell in love with Charudatta, Vasantasena used to like him. And now that Charudatta comes in the picture, she does not want to entertain Sangstanak anymore. With Charudatta and she does not love me anymore. His house is to the left. Look out and do not let her slip out of our hands. He not only gives us some information, he also gives Vasanta Sena some information that the wall just beside her is the wall of Charudatta's house. With this information, Vasanta Sena gets a lot of confidence. Now she knows that she has a place she can safely hide in. Oh, wonderful! If his house is really at my left hand, now this is said in aside. Aside is where a character speaks to himself or herself and only the audience can hear that person and other characters are on stage who cannot hear what that person is saying. Oh wonderful, if his house is really at my left hand, then the scoundrel has helped me in the very act of hurting me for he has guided me to my love. So this is a confirmation that yes, Vasantasena truly has a lot of feelings for Charudatta. Now a lot of commotion goes on and she manages to find a side entrance, a kind of door uh, to Charudatta's house on that wall. But she finds that the door is shut. Now inside Charudatta's house, right at that moment, what was happening? Charudatta wants to send Moitreya out to uh, give some uh, more offerings to gods. Moitreya is not interested. He doesn't want to go out. And then Charudatta kind of... Uh, emotionally blackmails him saying that see nobody bothers about uh, what I want okay and then Moitra says okay fine I'm going but he says that okay ask Radhanika to go with me maybe he's afraid of the dark maybe he wants her company we don't know that but Radhanika goes and while they are going out of the house through that door outside of which Vasantasena is standing Radhanika is holding a candle perhaps and while she moves out, Vasantasena blows that candle off because she does not want to be seen. And in that darkness, while they move out, Vasantasena manages to slip in. Now after this what happens, the people who were chasing Vasantasena, they have not seen this happen. They have not seen Vasantasena slip into the house and another woman come out. So when they come close to Radhanika, who has gone out with Moitreyo, they feel that this is Vasantasena, like from a distance, uh, both are women. And while they start uh, chasing her up, Moitreyo confronts them and on seeing Moitreyo, they realize that, okay, we have made a mistake and they are chased away. So this is how the problem is solved temporarily, at least for the night. So Moitreyo and Radhanika, they don't understand what's happening and they just go away. Vasantasena is inside Charudatta's house right now. Charudatta does not know anything about what has happened. Now, one thing might bug you that if this courtier, Sanstanak, they were uh, such royal characters, very powerful men indeed, uh, why were they uh, scared of Moitreyo? Why was the courtier especially not very eager to confront Moitreyo? In fact, Sansanak asks the courtier later that why are you behaving like this? Why can't we just storm that house? What, what's stopping us? And he asks him, what were you afraid of? Of Charudatta's virtues. Virtues? He? You can go into his house and not find a thing to eat. So for Sansanak, virtue means wealth. Virtue means social position how much money you have, that is your virtue. The courtier says, no, no, his loving kindness unto such as we has brought his low at last. So now we realize that the courtier was also one of the friends that uh, Charudatta had and he gave his wealth to. From him could no man learn what insults be or ever his wealth was passed, this well-filled pool that in its summer day gave others drink itself is dried away. So he was like this pool from which others drank but now that is dried up. 
Sansanak is not interested. He says, Who is the son of a slave wench anyway? Brave Shvetaketu, is he Pandu's child? Again, his, his knowledge of scriptures is horrible. Or Radha's son, the ten-necked ogre wild. Ravan cannot be Radha's son, but he makes it that way. Or Indradatta, or again, is he son of brave Rama and fair Kunti? Uh, anybody would know that Rama's wife was Sita, but he says that Rama and Kunti were a pair. Or Dharmaputra, Ashwatthama bolt, perhaps Jatayu shelf, that vulture old fool. I will tell you who Charudatta is. Now the courtier is sick and tired of this fool called Sansthanak and he says, he actually calls him a fool. Fool, I will tell you who Charudatta is. A tree of life to them whose sorrows grow. Beneath its fruit of virtue bending low, father to good men. So the kind of words that the courtier is using, it establishes Charudatta's character in front of us. And we believe that uh, your friends will always praise you. That is normal. But when people who are not related to you anymore, they praise you, that is real praise. And this establishes Charudatta as a very sincere, honest and good man. And we have no problem in looking at him as a heroic figure. A righteous man whom pride could never blight, a treasure house with human virtues stored, courtesies, essence, honors, precious hoard, etc. etc. So he goes on uh, praising him a lot. And they disappear without Vasanta Sena. But before uh, leaving, Shanstanak informs Moetrio that he should tell Charudatta that if he does not give Vasanta Sena up, does not give Vasanta Sena to Sanstanak, then Sanstanak will file a lawsuit and will fight him and all kind of threats he gives. Anyway, inside Charudatta's house, what's happening? Charudatta doesn't know that it's Vasanta Sena who is inside his house. He sees that uh, the figure of a woman is in his courtyard and she's like covered herself. He is looking at her from behind and he thinks that it is Radhanika, perhaps the woman who serves his household. Radhanika, Rohasena likes the fresh air. Rohasena is Charudatta's son, a little child. But he will be cold in the evening, chill. Pray, bring him into the house and cover him with this mantle. So he gives this mantle, this chadar and asks this lady to bring the child inside the house. Vasanta Sena is speaking to herself. See, he thinks I am his servant. She takes the mantle and wraps herself up. Oh, beautiful, the mantle is fragrant with jasmine. His youthful days are not wholly indifferent to the pleasures of the world. And she feels that, okay, he has this beautiful perfume in this mantle. That means he likes perfume. That means he is interested in pleasures of life. So that is giving her some ideas, perhaps. Come, Radhanika, take Rohasena and enter the heart of the house. Ah, me unhappy that have little part or lot in your heart. Vasanta Sena is feeling bad that uh, she doesn't have any share in his life right now. Come, Radhanika, will you not even answer? Alas! So, Charudatta feels that nobody cares whatever I say. My friend, he says, I won't do what you ask me to. Now, my maid servant, she is refusing to follow my orders. Everything is happening because I don't have any wealth. And he goes on thinking on those terms. Right then, Moitreya re-enters with real Radhanika. Sir, here is Radhanika. Here is Radhanika. Who then is this? This unknown lady by my robe, thus clinging, desecrated. Desecrated means like his robe has insulted her because she is maybe somebody very honorable and she is holding his robe so it is like desecration but she feels that she is consecrated that it's like an honor for her 
until she seems the crescent moon with clouds of autumn mated. So if she is hiding her face, like only uh, a little part of her face is revealed, so like the crescent moon. And Charudatta makes this spontaneously. Okay, he speaks about this comparison automatically and then he feels that I should not uh, talk uh, like this about another person's wife. But no, I may not gaze upon another's wife. Till now, it's fine. It's pretty morally sound that you don't want to engage with another woman who belongs to a different family. Moitrio makes a very interesting observation. This is Vasanta Sena who has been in love with you ever since she saw you in the garden where Kama's temple stands. What? This is Vasanta Sena? My love for whom my fortune spent, my wretched self in twain has rent, like coward's anger inward bent. So we know that Charudatta also has a lot of feelings for Vasanta Sena. Where is the problem then? Just a few moments back, he said that he should not be looking at another man's wife. Why? Because another man's wife is engaged to a man. But isn't he engaged to a woman too? Isn't he father of Rohasena? Doesn't he have a wife? So why is it okay for him to gaze at another woman when he is a husband? I don't know. That was the way society was formulated back then. That was the way it was accepted. Uh, the accepted code of conduct, you can say. And that kind of offered a lot of social standing to these uh, women who engaged in prostitution too because they could very well be attached with any man who was married to somebody. And we have to keep in mind that uh, from our perspective, we might have problems in looking at Charudatta as a morally correct person, as a completely heroic person. But back then, the audience for whom Shudraka wrote, to them this was quite acceptable, quite acceptable. And therefore, there was no problem uh, if Charudatta was the hero and still if he behaved in this way. So this was the accepted code of conduct for any person according to the audience back then. And then Moitreo says that this is Vasanta Sena and there is this threat, this son Stanak, the brother-in-law of the king has uh, asked us to give her up, asked you to give her up so that uh, there might be peace between you two, otherwise there would be problems. Charudatta is not at all bothered, he is a fool. How is this maiden worthy of the worship that we pay a goddess? For now, although I bade her enter, yet she seeks to spare my poverty, nor enters here. Though men are known to her, yet all she speaks contains no words to wound a modest ear. So she might be a prostitute. Men are known to her. So she is not a stranger to men, but she does not use any abusive language. She has a very nice uh, way of speaking. So he is surprised by the kind of beauty that Vasantasena is uh, representing here, the kind of modesty that she is showing. He uh, seeks forgiveness that I had mistaken you to be my servant. So I'm really very sorry. And Vasantasena in turn, she says that I am sorry for uh, bothering you with this intrusion. I have come this in this unexpected way. So both of them are seeking forgiveness like bending down and Moitreo says that you will now knock your heads together because both of you are bending towards each other. So that's a comic scenario here. Vasanta Sena then makes a request. Sir, I should be glad to leave these jewels in your house. It was for the sake of the jewels that those scoundrels pursued me. Was it because of the jewels? No. Vasanta Sena is making that up. Why? Because she doesn't want to tell Charudatta that men are interested in her. She wants to be exclusive for him. So this is very strange because with her profession, where she is not an exclusive lover of anybody, she still tries to remain exclusive to Charudatta and says that they were pursuing me for the jewels. 
I want to keep the jewels here with you safe so that I can go home safely. This house is not worthy of the trust. So I am a poor man. Why do you want to do this here? You mistake, sir. It is to men that treasures are entrusted, not the houses. So how, why, why, why are you talking about the house? Trustworthy or not. I am not trusting this house. I am trusting the man in this house. So that is very emotional. Moitreo, will you receive the jewels? I am much indebted to you. So she is very happy that she can keep the jewels with him. Is she keeping the jewels really because she wants to keep them safe? Or is she keeping the jewels because she wants to get them back and while getting them back, she might have another visit at this house or maybe Charudatta would take the jewels back to her house. So she's trying to create a situation in future where they might meet again by keeping the jewels here. Then Moitri is instructed to accompany Vasantasena back home. But he refuses to go alone again. Charudatta decides to go himself. And then when Moitra looks for torches, he says we don't need torches. And he gives such poetic lines here. See, we have a lamp upon the king's highway. So he's probably talking about the moon here. Attended by her starry servants all. So the moon with the stars, they are like this royalty. And pale to see as a loving maiden's cheeks rises before our eyes the moon's bright ball, whose pure beams on the high piled darkness fall like streaming milk that dried up marshes seeks. So this is where we see that Charudatta has a lot of poetry in him. Later also we'll find that when he is sad or when he is happy, when he is waiting for his lover, he will use poetry. And this is where Although it is a prakarana, still we find poetry which we actually find in Natakas. So these are the improvisations on the form of the prakarana that Shudraka is making. So he is using elements of Nataka in here to create a different kind of effect, a different kind of hero than we usually find in prakaranas. And then they reach Vasantasena's home. They have this very emotional look at each other. Vasantasena is looking at him and exits. And then he tells Moitreo, Vasantasena is gone. Come, let us go home. All creatures from the highway take their flight. The watchmen pace their rounds before our sight. To forestall treachery is just and right. For many sins find shelter in the night. And you shall guard this golden casket by night and Vardhamanaka by day. So they decide to keep the jewels in a safe way and return them when she needs them. So the questions uh, that the first act raises, uh, these are multiple questions. First, we have questions about ownership of the woman's body. Okay. So while developing an answer on Vasantasena's character, you can point out how society allowed her some choices and how she is trying to make those choices here. What kind of heroism we are to expect? Uh, what kind of hero is Charudatta here? I will give you a definite idea about uh, what kind of hero Charudatta is, but here we will have to keep in mind certain traits in the very first act. What are the qualities that we are aware of? Number one, he is a sober person, an honest person, a person who has admirable qualities of honesty and good sense. And at the same time, he has a poetic heart and he has a lover's heart. So these are the qualities which we find in him. We also see a lot of common men and women in this first act itself starting from the prologue and of course uh, the Prakrit language everyday conversations uh, these give the flavor of the Prakarana to the whole play. So this first act is like the starting point from where we will have rising action 
and eventually the climax of the play. Some of the acts are earmarked for detailed study in WBSU syllabus. Uh, I will try to be more detailed when we will take up those acts. Uh, so far as the other acts are concerned, I will deal with those acts, maybe not in that detailed way, but we will still uh, go through the important uh, passages and lines and speeches so that by the end of this series, you will have a very comprehensive idea of the play and you will be ready to answer not just long questions, but reference to context short questions as well as MCQ types. Thank you for being with me till the very end. I hope to see you all very soon with our reading of the second act of Mitchekatika by Shudraka. This is Monami Mukherjee. Stay subscribed, stay happy, stay safe. Bye-bye.